just want to uh, jump on and say Happy Mother's Day. If you, uh, if your mom is still with you, and want to encourage you, don't text her, <laughs> call her. And if you are within uh, reasonable driving distance, go see her. Okay. Uh, just uh, Andy's the only one here that can text, okay? Everyone else, I think, is uh, at least owes their mom a phone call. So uh, please call them. Just a word from your pastor. It's, uh, it's wonderful to connect with your mom. And so if uh, you're in that situation and being able to do that, do that. Hey, got a special announcement before, uh, before I start. You know, this guy's been here a couple times but he's never been here as my future son-in-law. This is Josiah Johnson up here. He, uh, I don't know whether you want to talk to him or not, but if you want to tell him what it's like to sign on into the Hornox, uh, you can tell him. And if that cancels the whole deal, well, <laughs> Josiah will tell on you. So uh, anyway, hey, you know, uh, this is Mother's Day, and as I prayed, you know, it's a great day. We honor moms, and uh, we're all excited for them, but you know, I think all of us uh, hopefully are aware enough to know that it, it's not a great day for everyone. There's a lot of people that it's like, okay, the relationship with mom wasn't so great, or mom and the relationship with the kids hasn't been so great I mean it might not be a great day because you know what mom's gone I mean uh, there's been a few of us in the last uh, not just in the last day but in the last year or so mom's no longer with us that's hard I know that there's many that that they'd love to be a mom but they don't you know may it be a fertility issue might be just because they're not married and mothering is uh, just not a, what God has for them right now. Uh, you know, mothers is, 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 is wonderful, and it should be celebrated, and we as a church want to honor it tremendously, but at the same time, we want to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, it's one of those days that often reminds some of what God hasn't done in their life, uh, what hadn't happened in their life, and so uh, we want to be sensitive to it. But you know, I think all of us, because we all had a mom, and whether that relationship with mom was what it should have been, or maybe wasn't, wasn't what it should have been, we all know what it should have been. We all, we all kind of have the concept that mom is huge. She's significant. I mean, there, there is, a, there is a, a power that a mom has in a child's life that, that is unmatched. I mean, yeah, dads have that same kind of a power, but it's in a little different way. And I think they accomplish some different things. But there's something, there, there, there's something different, uh, unique, powerful in the relationship of, that a mother has with a person that they're mothering. And uh, so what I want us to do today is just kind of explore that a little bit and I've got great news. There's an aspect of it that all of us can benefit from, not just the females in the room, but all of us. All of us can benefit from understanding that mothering thing a little better, and particularly thinking about it in terms of being a spiritual mother. And that actually applies to all of us as I'm going to demonstrate uh, towards the end of our time. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 16. Now, if you've read through the Bible, you know that one of the things, particularly in the New Testament, at the end of his letters, at the end of his books, his epistles, the Apostle Paul often uh, takes the time to say hi to some people. Greet this person. Greet that person. Hey, tell this person this. And at the end of Romans, which no doubt is, is, you know, we'd like to say it's his greatest 
book and it's greatest because it's got the most content the most valuable or at least the most pertinent content to our relationship with Jesus Christ at the end of it he, he has this long list of people that he greets so you're in Romans 16 look at verse 1 he says I commend to you uh, our sister Phoebe and then you go to verse 3 I greet Prisca and Aquila that's Priscilla and Aquila you know and then just all the way down through and then get to verse 13 I never really had seen this thing I know I'd read it because I've read the Bible but you know what I don't think I'd ever saw this detail before look at verse 13 greet Rufus a choice man or maybe better translated a chosen man in the Lord and his mother and then look at those last two words and mine and mine uh, now we're pretty certain Rufus isn't his big brother or little brother this is not a biological relationship and therefore this woman this mother isn't Paul's biological mom we're, we're pretty certain that that's not it I mean this is just way too casual of a mentioning because you can see he goes on for another three verses saying hi to people and it took him 12 verses to get to her uh, my mom wasn't that emotional she wasn't that big into uh, all the foo-foo things that we do at Mother's Day but I can just guarantee you she would have been a little offended if I greeted her as the uh, 12th person in a list you know oh by the way hey thanks mom you know and got it for some more people to mention so we don't think this is Paul's biological brother nor do we think this is his biological mother in reality what we think is that this woman at some point in Paul's life had a strategic role and because Paul was so spiritually minded that strategic role is this lady helped him in his spiritual life as a spiritual mother and so that's why in verse 13 he says greet Rufus a man chosen by God and his mom and my mom too so here's the question we're going to try to answer today who is Paul's mom who is this lady well you could say duh Rufus's mom okay well that raises a question who in the world was Rufus who's Rufus well okay this book think about it this book is written to Rome Bible Church if we were a Baptist, I would have said Rome Baptist Church or First Baptist Church of Rome or Rome Presbyterian, but we're Bible Church and we know that's how everybody should be. So this church was written to Rome Bible Church. And all these people that he's mentioned, they're people in Rome Bible Church. So Rufus was someone in the church and his mom was still there in the church. Well, here's what I want you to do there was another book that was written to Rome Bible Church there was another book that, the, 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 that probably most likely the original first time readers or hearers of the book was Rome Bible Church you know what book it was the Gospel of Mark so turn with me over to Mark chapter, five, uh, chapter 15. See, here's the deal. Okay, we've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now Mark, you probably know this, and if not, you should know it. Mark was probably a teenager when Jesus was alive. Uh, he wasn't one of the 12. He probably wasn't even an adult. I think he's, he's a teenager, so he's kind of a pre-adult. So big body understood a lot but just not all the way there yet in terms of being an adult and what we think according to tradition and it's pretty good uh, tradition Peter linked up with Mark 
And towards the end of Peter's life, Mark, through the inspiration of Peter and obviously the Holy Spirit, Mark recorded the life of Jesus. And that's the Gospel of Mark. So in a way, it's like it was the Gospel of Peter as told to and recorded by Mark. And where were they? In Rome. And who probably got to read that book first? Rome Bible Church. Now look at chapter 15, and I'm not there yet, you guys probably are. Look at chapter 15, verse 21. Really start in uh, verse 20. Now we're in the section where Mark is telling us about the crucifixion. Jesus has been tried, convicted, and they are going to crucify him out on Calvary. And in verse 20, at the end of the verse, it says, and they, these Roman soldiers, led him, Jesus, out to be crucified. So Jesus is carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem up towards Golgotha or Calvary. And look at verse 21. And they, evidently the soldiers, probably because Jesus had, I mean, he'd, he'd pulled an all-nighter the night before. They'd already beat him, scourged him, whipped him, abused him. He's physically exhausted, and now he's supposed to carry this cross because that's what they did with convicted criminals, made them carry their cross out to the place of execution. Probably Jesus just couldn't keep up or they didn't think he could keep up and so what did they do in verse 21 it says and they these Roman soldiers pressed into service a passerby coming from the country a guy named Simon of Cyrene and then in my Bible the translators properly put a parenthesis the father of Alexander and Rufus, that he might bear the cross. Now, this book was written originally for the benefit of the people in Rome. And all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them mention Simon. And I'm going to talk about that again in a little bit here. But it's like Simon became a very well-known follower of Christ. And Matthew mentions him, Luke mentions him, John mentions him, Mark mentions him. But only Mark said, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Only Mark mentions that little detail. Why? Well, it's probably a good guess because as they're reading this thing, it's like saying, you know, Sam's dad. Sam's dad did that. Fred's dad did that. Simon, Alexander and Rufus's dad, he's the one that carried the cross. And so Mark wanted the congregation to know this connection that their friend Rufus had to Simon. So who was Rufus? He's the son of Simon, the guy that carried the cross of Christ. And like I said, Simon, Simon, we think, became a very strong believer and, and, and all the Gospels mention him. He, he kind of becomes a bit of a folk hero. Now, let, let's just tease this thing out a little bit. Because, you know, even though this is just, you know, about 15 or 20 words here mentioned, there's a ton of information in there. Okay, they pressed into service a passerby named Simon. Okay, get the picture. They have, have tried Jesus. They've beaten Jesus. Now they've convicted him, and he's carrying this cross out to Calvary. And there's like a, a, a parade, if you will. Soldiers and then three people that are going to be executed, Jesus and the two guys with him. And a lot of people are going, walking, along with it. Jesus' mother is there. John the, John the Apostle is there. Other people are there with him. Well, 
Simon wasn't one of those people. What was he doing? He just was held up in the traffic. It's like there was a crossing guard saying, stop, hey, whoa, whoa, let these people pass through. It's kind of like a funeral procession. Simon wasn't part of the throng. He was just someone that had what? Come into town from the country. Now remember, at Passover time, Jerusalem they say the population swelled to about a million people because all these Jews were coming from all over the Roman Empire, if they could afford it, to celebrate Passover. And here is this guy named Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene, where in the world is Cyrene? You know where Cyrene is? You ever heard of Benghazi? Has that been in the news in the last 10 years or so? Remember, what was it, one of our embassies? There was a huge attack. Benghazi was not far from the little region of Cyrene, northern Africa, west of Egypt, east of modern-day Libya. That's Cyrene. And so here is Simon, who probably came to Jerusalem, which is a pretty good haul, float really because he would have gone across the Mediterranean Sea and he goes to Jerusalem why because he is a devout Jew there to celebrate Passover and so here's Simon what is he doing he's staying out in the country probably because that was the closest place he could get a hotel you know he would have loved to have been right downtown but those things had been booked forever he gets, he's got to go from the, tr- con- from the country in. And what's, what did he come into town for? To get his Passover lamb processed. It's just a euphemism for saying sacrificed. <laughs> but what happened to him? Instead of getting his Passover lamb, he met the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And And... I mean, I would think if Simon has to carry this cross all the way out to Calvary, by then he probably would have been a little bit curious because he wanted to know, why are they killing this guy? Okay, why are they killing this guy? Why are they killing this guy? And, and who knows, maybe Simon stayed there long enough and he realized, okay, that guy deserves it, that guy deserves it, but... This guy's different. I mean, he might have even been there close enough to the cross still when the soldiers gathered all around and threw Jesus down on it and started nailing the the nails into his hand and he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And and Simon probably hadn't been to a lot of executions, but he, he was smart enough to realize that's different. I think that something happened in Simon's life that day and this guy who was a devout enough Jew to come all the way from Benghazi to Jerusalem to come and just observe Passover his life was changed and you know right there I just got to stop I mean that is so cool to me because you know there are some of us and I'm actually one of those who, who can sit and say you know what that day changed my family history really in my story I've got two days that changed my family history December 7th and October 15th Uh, you guys have heard this probably a dozen times or more December 7th the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor my dad was 20 years old and a week it was a week after his 20th birthday and my dad grew up just a hard-nosed, unsaved, pagan Roman Catholic. I mean, he was a tough guy. He was a wild guy. He was a sailor with all capital letters. That's all I need to say. But you know what happened? He was there aboard the USS St. Louis at 755, hoping to get leave because he and his brother Joe were going to go into Honolulu and go to a football game. But God did something totally different. The Japanese came, they bombed. Uh, 
I remember my dad saying he, they, he was awake for 72 hours because it was just everybody had to be so vigilant because they went out, they finally got out of the harbor, they patrolled and all that stuff. Uh, that isn't when he got saved. You know what happened that day? That's when God started the process of taking his heart that was stone and turning it into a heart of flesh. And it's really fascinating how things work because in my dad's life, that's what softened him to the gospel. Uh, his brother Joe, my uncle Joe, I mean, uh, honestly, they didn't know the name back then, but he suffered PTSD till the day he died. I think he actually got saved somewhere along the line, but totally changed his life, and he went in a totally different direction. But my dad, all of a sudden, my dad realized his immortality or his, excuse me, his mortality. And, and my dad started having a little respect for people. He wasn't the cocky little Hungarian kid from, from South Virginia. So much so that 21 months later, on October 15th, two goody two-shoe sailors who ultimately became preachers David Wallace, and I can never remember the other guy's name. I meant to look it up this morning. They invited him to go to chapel on October 15th, 1943. Now, chapel's supposed to have a couple hundred people at it, maybe even more. I mean, good grief, there's 50,000 sailors stationed there at Dutch Harbor, Alaska. That's where they were by this time. But uh, only three guys showed up for church. Two guys that are ultimately going to become preachers and this unsaved pagan that's starting to get a little softer side to him. And if I was J.D. Tullis, the chaplain, I would have said, hey, guys, why don't we go for coffee? We'll, I'll wait till more people come to give the lesson. He didn't. He carried on as if there were a thousand people there. And that night, my dad trusted Christ. December 7th, October 15th. That was the day my family changed. And you know, quite frankly, I look back on it and I think every one of my siblings, every one of my in-laws has trusted Christ. My parents had 27 grandchildren. Every one of them have trusted Christ. I don't even, I've lost count of how many great-grandchildren they had. I don't know of any of them that are old enough to trust Christ that haven't trusted Christ. Where did it start? December 7th, on October 15th. That was the kind of day this was for Rufus's family, for Simon's family. You know, and I love this story because, you know, we always hear these stories about how your family changed. Sometimes it's some kids started going to Awana and then the parents felt guilty, so they kind of started going to the awards night and this, or maybe the Bible study that was going on during Awana. But ultimately, God saves, saves that kid, and then he gets the older siblings, and then eventually mom, and then in about 12 years later, dad finally comes along. Or maybe the story is mom finally wakes up and realizes, you know, we are a pagan family, and mom starts getting spiritually minded, and so what does mom do? She drags the kids to church, and what does dad do? You know, he's out in the garage tinkering before it, you know, while it's time to go to church so that nobody puts any peer pressure on him. And so mom comes, the kids come, they, they kind of catch the vision, and maybe someday dad finally catches it, but even unfortunately, a lot of times they don't. I love this story because you know what happened on this day? Guys, listen, dad had a spiritual experience with Christ. I think this was the day that Simon came face to face with a Savior, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He thought he was just going to go get a lamb processed so that he and his family could have Passover dinner that night. God had a bigger vision for his life. That's what happened to Simon on that day. So who was Rufus? Rufus was Simon's son this guy that evidently had a life-transforming experience with Jesus Christ on the very day that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. 
But remember, we're, we're, there, that's not the question we are trying to ask. We're trying to ask the question, who is Paul's mom? Because what happened in uh, uh, Romans 16, Paul says, hey, greet Rufus, this chosen man. And boy, wasn't that ironic. Because dad, Simon, was there in Jerusalem and it just looked like he was randomly selected nothing's random with God he's randomly selected and Paul is just saying boy isn't it ironic that God specifically chose Simon because Simon is going to get saved his wife's going to get saved his sons are going to get saved they're all going to be mentioned in scripture and his wife Mrs. Simon is going to have a huge impact in Paul's life that's really what this sermon's all about so here's the question how in the world did Paul and Mrs. Simon meet well turn with me to Acts chapter 15 and I know uh, we're bouncing all around but um, hopefully you can find it if you got a phone hopefully you can find it even faster but look at Acts chapter 15 okay Jesus has been crucified he rose from the dead He's gone back to heaven. The church has started. There's thousands of people that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Stephen, one of the, the, the high profile people of the church, had been martyred by the Jews there in Acts uh, 7 to the, at the end of it. And uh, after that martyrdom, there was a major persecution that broke out. And so the Christians had to flee they had to get out of dodge and uh, verse 19 Acts, 9, uh, Acts chapter 11 verse 19 reads this way so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that broke out in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and a place called Antioch verse 20 and there were some of them men of Cyprus and men of Cyrene kind of interesting but the only other time Cyrene is even mentioned who came to Antioch and they were speaking to the Gentiles preaching to them about the Lord Jesus and the hand of the Lord was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord we think perhaps because we're trying to answer the question how in the world did Paul and Mrs. Simon cross paths so that Mrs. Simon could have had a relationship with him that Paul would later years later say she was like a spiritual mom to me we think it happened here in Antioch verse 22 man the word got out and the people in Jerusalem said hey we got to check this out make sure everything's okay so they send Barnabas off to Antioch he comes there he checks it out he sees that everything is going great and then it take a little long to, to explain it all but hopefully some of you remember your Bible history you know that by this time the Apostle Paul has come to know Christ but he's just low level because nobody in their right mind would trust this guy that used to persecute everybody kill some people and he hung around Jerusalem for a few weeks but basically he was not driven out of town but it was greatly suggested you ought to go back home because nobody likes you here in Jerusalem so he went back home check out this map he went back home to Tarshish and Barnabas who had had a lot of contact with him is in Antioch well after he gets to Antioch and he realizes hey everything's cool here this church is going and blowing and doing well he's like well I came all this way I wonder what's been going on with that guy named Saul who later is going to become known as Paul and so what do you see verse 25 Barnabas leaves Tarshish to look for Saul 
And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, we don't hear a lot about what life was like in Tarsus, but over in Galatians 1, we could go over there and put in there, Paul was over there telling all of his people about Christ. But think about it. Okay, think about this. Because I think this is really significant. Okay, here's, here's Saul, whose name's going to be changed to Paul. He's from Tarsus. But this guy is brilliant enough that they send him to Jerusalem and he studies with the most respected rabbi there was, Gamaliel. I mean, this guy, he isn't from a big city like Texarkana. This guy is from, I don't know, pick your favorite small town, smaller town. And they send him off and he's doing a double degree at Harvard and MIT. This guy is brilliant. And he is studying under the best professor there is, and he is getting a PhD in Jewish studies. And he, because he was so good and so profound, they put him in charge of stomping out this Jesus cult. And he is stomping out that Jesus cult and what happens he meets Jesus' father and he joins the cult and they're like uh uh the people in Tarsus are like can I get my money back I helped fund that guy's education I was part of the rotary club that contributed money so this guy could go off to Harvard and MIT I mean, we, we did fundraisers. I, I gave money to his GoFundMe thing, and I wanted a real Jew doing real Jewish work, stomping out all these cults. And Paul, when, when things got too hot and the official said, hey, go home, he's like, I got to go back to Tarsus. He's been in Tarsus, and let me tell you, it wasn't going well. Most likely, mom and dad had disowned him. Any siblings he had had thought, well, you know, he's like Richard's Uncle Joe. He's got PTSD. And so they're not listening to him. And, and the Apostle Paul was kind of, I mean, remember what he was doing for a living? This guy is a scholar. Okay, PhD in Jewish studies. What's he doing? He's making tents. He's got a regular blue-collar job that he could have got right out of middle school. And Barnabas goes and gets him and says, hey, we got some great things going on over at Antioch Bible. And maybe you ought to come on over here. So Paul and Barnabas go from Tarsus back to Antioch Bible. And it was probably there in Antioch Bible that this young guy met Mrs. Simon. Because there was a bunch of people from Cyrene that had gone to Antioch. Okay, I understand that's an assumption, but that's the best we got. What would it have been like? Okay, here's this superstar guy that had just had his legs cut out from under him. And finally, it's like God bails him out of the fiery furnace and he gets to come over to Antioch Bible and he shows up at church. He's young, single, hurting. He knows his dad hates his guts and he's a big disappointment to his dad. He knows his mom, you know, probably wishes he'd never been born because he didn't turn out. I mean, we gave him everything. And this hurting guy walks into the church. And who befriended him? Mrs. Simon. Mrs. Simon. Who knows, maybe, maybe she invited him over for dinner after church. And she has two sons. She's got Rufus and Alexander, so it's not weird. She has him over, they talk, 
you know, and in a way, she got to become the mom, the spiritual mom that he never had. And she listened to him. And, and maybe at strategic points, she slipped in some proper theology and maybe a proper perspective. Paul, have you ever sat and thought about that maybe God has used the last 10 years of your life because he wanted to knock off some of those rough edges? Have you ever sat and thought about that God might be doing this in your life? Now, I went to a long explanation to try to make this connection for you. So here's the question. What's the point of it all? You know what I think the point of it all is? Every one of us, every one of us who knows the Lord, we have the opportunity when someone walks in these doors, because we don't know who they are, we have the opportunity to reach out and be family to them. You know, that, that guy might be superstar PhD in Jesus studies, but he could be superstar PhD in something else. And when he finally came out for Christ, he lost it all. Lost his credibility, lost his, his family relationships. He was hurting. And I think that it is so significant that someone in that church reached out and loved him like a mother would love. And after writing the greatest theological book that's ever been written, the book of Romans, as he's listing off all the people, Paul says, say hi to my spiritual mom, Rufus and his mom. They had such an impact on me. I think that's what Paul's saying. And you know what? Here's the point. The point is, we can be like Antioch Bible. We, we got people walking in here and, and they're hurting. They got needs. They, they, they've got, like all of us, they've got a string of broken relationships and every once in a while there's a Mother's Day that reminds them of a broken relationship or it reminds them of something they've always wanted but they don't have it yet. And so they're here dressed, showered, maybe perfumed, smiling, but they're dying on the inside. And why did they come? Well, yeah, they came to worship Jesus. They, they, they're maybe smart enough to know that. But they mostly came because they wanted a connection. You know what they wanted? They wanted to be in a family. And so I think here's the, here's the thing. Here's the point to us. We need to be a good family. I think one of the greatest opportunities we as a church family have is to be an extended family to one another. And you know, when I think about the, the experience that we've all had over the last 13, 14 months, I mean, I know God has been using it for big things, but I know one of the things Satan has been using it for is to, is to totally loosen those family ties and, and, and cause us to get distant from one another. And, and now maybe God is bringing it to a close and so the time now where we can reestablish that, but let me tell you, a church needs to be a place where people can come and be loved. And, 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 and they maybe need some dinners and on the fifth dinner, they can say, you know what, it just breaks my heart that my dad is so disappointed in me. I don't know, did Paul say that to Mrs. Simon? I can tell you, I would have, if I'd have been in his situation. My mom, I am the major disappointment of her life. She thought I was going off to Harvard and MBA, MIT, and I was going to be the next Gamaliel. <sighs> the only person that would hire me is the tent maker. I mean, Paul had some hurts. And you know what? Maybe there would have never been 
a Romans, a 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and maybe even Hebrews. If there had never been a Mrs. Simon. If there had never been a Mr. Simon. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm out of time. Just throw this in for free. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, start at verse 7. Go down to verse 12. In verse 7, Paul says, When I was among you, I was like a nursing mother to you. Then you get to verse 12, he says, I was like your daddy. Now, if the Apostle Paul can say he was like a nursing mom and loving them, I think us guys in the room, we can be some mamas today to some of these people. But you know what? We got, I mean, we are so selfish sometimes. We are so self-consumed. We, we, we allow our schedules to get so busy, we don't have time. Here's a person that's got tons of needs. Wish somebody would reach out to them. Let's text Andy. Let's text Richard. Maybe they can get someone. Isn't that what they get paid to do? I see the need. Boy, it just jumps off the page at me. Somebody's got to do something about it. Why doesn't why do you do something about it? Maybe God's showing you because you're the one that needs to invite those people over to your house for dinner. Let me ask you, when's the last time you had someone over to your house for dinner? I mean, I didn't ask, is your house cleaned? I didn't ask, is it easy to have them over for dinner? Because the trouble is, our houses are not clean, and it isn't easy. But let me tell you, one of the most effective things that I think Vicki and I have done through the years is have people over to our house for dinner. When's the last time you did that? Or take them out to lunch or breakfast? or go out to dinner with them. I mean, this stuff doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional. I'm so thankful that Mrs. Simon kept enough white space in her schedule, enough margin in her life, that she reached out to a guy named Saul who was hurting like crazy, and God used her to change the world. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege that we have today just to think about the opportunities we have. Father, help us to get a handle on our busyness, on our priorities. Help us to recognize that uh, one of the only investments that really counts is what we do in the lives of others. Father, help us to open up our eyes and see people as they really are, created in your image, but having to function in a very fallen world. And they got bruises all over them, they've got some cuts, maybe even some breaks. And they just need some mamas in their life who can love them and show some compassion and at the right time speak some truth like good mamas do blunt truth but it comes from someone that they know loves them unconditionally I pray Father today that uh, we would be that kind of a church for it's in Christ's name we pray Amen